The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and give them the fire of thy love. Set forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by that same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in this consolation. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. May the divine assistance remain always with us. And may the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. And O Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Je l'ai résumé au cardinal Ratzinger, en quelques mots, n'est-ce pas? Oui, même si vous nous accordez un évêque, même si vous nous accordez une certaine autonomie par, par rapport aux évêques, même si vous nous accordez toute la liturgie de 1962, pas, de 1962, si vous nous accordez enfin, les, de continuer les séminaires et la fraternité comme nous le faisons maintenant, nous ne pourrons pas collaborer. C'est impossible. Impossible. Parce que nous travaillons en direction diamétralement opposée. Vous, vous travaillez à la déchristianisation de la société, de la personne humaine et de, 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 de l'Église, et nous, nous travaillons à la christianisation. On ne peut pas s'entendre. Rome a perdu la foi, mes chers amis. Rome est dans l'apostasie. Ce n'est pas des paroles, ce n'est pas des mots en l'air que je vous dise. C'est la vérité. Rome est dans l'apostasie. On ne peut plus avoir confiance dans ce monde-là. Il, il a quitté l'Église, on quitté l'Église, il quitte l'Église. C'est sûr, 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 sûr. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He's a member of the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you doing tonight? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. And yourself? Well, Father, thanks for being here. Good. Why, very well. Thank you for being here, too. No problem. My pleasure. Father, I wanted to uh, start with a response uh, that we received from an email and a discussion that we had in our most recent program concerning uh, a viewer from Germany who had written in with information uh, concerning an SSPX priest commenting on the Amazonian Synod, mm -hmm. and he provided us with some wonderful information pertaining to that. And I wanted to read his, uh, his reply here. He says, I just watched the latest episode of WCB. Thank you very much for bringing my email to the attention of Father Jenkins. I'm glad to learn that his criticism of the Society of St. Pius X is coming from a place of concern for the souls of the people involved rather than a personal grudge against the society. I would be happy to send Father anything that he wants or needs. It wouldn't be too much trouble. Please convey my gratitude to Father Jenkins and let him know that I will keep him and all faithful priests in my prayers. Once again, thank you very much for producing such an informative YouTube channel. That was a very nice email. Well, that's very kind of you. I appreciate hearing again from this gentleman. Mm -hmm. okay. I assume it was a gentleman. And again, I thank him for sending the Maritzblatt uh, mm -hmm. from Father David Cookley. Um, and uh, I, I'm glad that he this uh, gentleman did point out that uh, you know, he w was concerned whether my critique um, was a matter of concern or a matter of a grudge. You know. It's not a matter of that at all, quite the contrary. Um, I mean, personally, I would like to see the Society of St. Pius X flourish, insofar as it is traditional, insofar as it is really traditional Catholic. And I would wish that for any truly traditional Catholic organization or individuals. I'd like to see them all prosper because it's a matter of the, the Catholic Church itself, and the Catholic faith itself prospering. Uh, but my concern is that this is not the case. My concern is that the Society of St. Pius X is leading 
a large number of people in the wrong direction and trying to forge close ties with Francis and the modernists that are uh, infesting the Vatican right now, you know, the Novus Ordo, which is the modernist religion. And um, the gentleman uh, sent uh, this, this uh, article, sent a copy of this article by Father Kirkley, who's a, uh, I gather, one of the priors of the Society of St. Pius X in Germany, uh, the priory of saint de von Fleur, and uh, that uh, the, uh, the Monatsblatt, or the, the monthly, I guess you'd say, bulletin, or uh, talks about the, the Amazon, a new way for the church and for a ganzheitlich, um, that, that is referred to as like an integral, integral ecology. I think that's how it's actually referred to in English. A new way for an, a, 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 an integral ecology. Uh, they're talking about a new way of evangelization, okay? a new way to preach the gospel in the Amazon. That's what the document the working document speaks of. But I would just say in response, now that I've actually had a chance to read the article, mm -hmm. and um, the, uh, the article is in German, um, and it's, it's actually, it's an easy read, and um, it's very clearly written by Father Kukli. I compliment him on the clarity of his writing. But I think what it does show, in a sense, what I'm saying is that the Society of St. Pius X uh, is not actually addressing this issue. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd like to think there's more than I see here, more than he sent me. Uh, here we have a relatively brief article, which for the most part quotes what others are saying about the uh, the Instrumentum Laboris, the working document for this upcoming synod on the Amazon. Uh, a matter of five, six pages, um, large print, uh, and devoted mostly to saying what others are saying about it, but not really addressing the issue as the Society of St. Pius X. Not really issuing a statement of the Society of St. Pius X. But this is Father Cookley's own work. He's issuing out on his own authority for himself, right? An article by himself. This is a far cry from what one expect of what is supposed to be like the flagship traditional Catholic organization on the planet Earth right now. And that's at least how it kind of styles itself, the SSPX. I mean, you'd expect there to be some official position paper coming out from the highest authorities, you know, in the society. And, and yet, this is what we see here. Now, last week, before I read the article, and by the way, the article itself is, is fine, okay? But it definitely is not a statement of the Society of St. Pius X uh, as such. And um, I mentioned last week that um, I was primarily referring to the silence of the SSPX here in the United States of America. Right. Okay? And now... Um, Sundar Sol uh, sent me a copy of the, uh, the the letter from the district superior, dated July 18, 2019. This is the district superior's letter, the district superior of the Society of St. Pius X here in America, addressing the friends of the society. It's essentially a fundraising letter, basically, saying, please support our seminaries. And uh, again, Again, what, it, what we find here is, is very, very paltry. It's very meager. It doesn't even state any an analysis on the part of the Society of St. Pius X. It doesn't give a critique on the part of the Society of St. Pius X of the Amazonian Synod. It basically just quotes, in this case, Cardinal Walter Brunnmiller, uh, and quotes him about what his critique is. But it, it doesn't go into any, any depth, any real analysis, <clears throat> any real position of the society. I can read the whole thing. It's very, two very short paragraphs, basically uh, four sentences, not even that. And with the decreasing number of vocations, there are constant calls to redefine and update the role of the priest. These calls come from within and without the church. This year, the Holy See has called for an upcoming synod 
the Amazonian Synod, which threatens to drastically change the role of the priest and the nature of the priesthood. German Cardinal Walter Brandmüller recently published a public criticism of the, quote, working document, unquote, the planning tool of this Amazonian Synod. In his critique, Cardinal Brandmüller warns that one of the major aims of the Synod is the abolishment of priestly celibacy and the introduction of a female priesthood, starting first with female deacons. That's the whole reference right. in this. This is not what one would expect to be a worthy theological assessment of this <clears throat> impending disaster, right? Which is a, uh, actually a work of apostasy, basically, saying we have to bring in uh, the pagan theology of God, we have to bring in pagan spirituality, we have to introduce pagan rituals and ceremonies into our own worship. He, this is what the document is saying, and we need to ordain people who can do that, <coughs> beginning in the Amazon. And that means elders, men, married men, who know the pagan um, spirituality, theology, ritual, and so on, and the women. We need them because they know all these things, and they can bring these into our worship. I mean, this is tantamount, again, to uh, apostasy, but that's what modernism is. You know? So, um, the, um, if, if this is, is all anybody can, can show me, as far as what the Society of St. Pius X has to say about this upcoming synod, uh, the Pan Amazon region, and this uh, instrumental laborious working document that is going to be put in front of the people who are present there to start as a starting point for discussion. If that's all the evidence they have of anything said by Society of St. Pius X or its members, I, again, I, I come back to the point that there's something wrong. There's something wrong. And, and Tom, you might actually be aware of what that is because I know you've been looking into this and. Uh, I'd be very interested in hearing what you have found. Well, I think, Father, just you know, reading through um, the two letters that, that you've received there, I think it uh, is very suspicious, almost. I mean, like you say, it just seems like they're, they're only reporting the news, mm -hmm. essentially, saying this is what's happening, this is what others are saying about it. There's no real critique. Well, well I use the word ominous in a bulletin. There you go. Suspicious and, and ominously suspicious. Definitely. And perhaps, um, you know, a, a simple explanation for that can be found in a few different uh, links that we received from some of our, our faithful viewers. This first one I thought was, was fascinating, Father. It's a, uh, a Gloria TV interview. It's actually a video interview. Uh, there, there's a, a transcript summary of it here. So this is with, uh, with a James Bogle, who was the uh, former president of Una, Una Voce International. And he did this interview with Gloria TV, and he, he says in here that Pope Francis has fully regularized the Society of St. Pius X. He stressed that the SSPX and the sacraments administered by them, including marriages and confessions, have been formally recognized by Francis. The Society is also allowed to ordain to the priesthood whomever they see fit. Further, Francis appointed SSPX Bishop Bernard Fillet as a judge at the, Rota, the Roman Rota, the highest appellate tribunal in the church, thus recognizing his authority. Uh, they have a quote here, I don't see how much more regular you can get than that, end quote, Bogle concludes. He acknowledges, however, that there are a lot of intolerant bishops who still treat the SSPX as if it were ir irregular. To them, Bogle answers that those who do not like the integration of the SSPX quote, better have the argument with Pope Francis. So perhaps, Father, when one reads this and uh, considers what this James Bogle has said, perhaps that could be a very simple explanation for why the Society of St. Pius X has continued to remain reticent on this issue. And it's... It doesn't want to rock the boat. Right? They don't want to rock the boat. And, you know, if, if this is this is their church, if this is their pope, they don't want to be seen as, as criticizing them. Uh, they're part of them, they're part of that church, they're, they're in communion with Francis, he's the Holy Father, he's, he's the pope, he has the authority to do these kind of things. They don't want to be seen as opposing him. They, they want to be a regular, uh, they want to have regular canonical sure. status with them, and so perhaps... So, but it seems um, disingenuous to me, not want to... to 
muddy the waters mm -hmm. of the Amazon <laughs> by objecting. But, I, but Archbishop Lefebvre, whenever it came down to a question of pursuing some kind of political favor in Rome or denouncing the modernist errors against the faith, Archbishop Lefebvre never had to make that choice. He was always clear. It was upholding the faith. It was defending the faith that came first. And he would thunder against the errors of the modernists. He said, we are not in communion with modernist Rome. We are in communion with Catholic Rome. And uh, I don't see that being the case now with the society, the, the, the neo-society of St. Pius X. Uh, no, and they seem to be pursuing uh, some kind of a reunion uh, at any cost. And I think they're, they're sacrificing essential things here. Standing and up for the faith. Father, I think it gets even worse than that. Um, again, to, to read through some of these uh, quotes from this, this James Bogle, he, uh, he says that Bishop Fillet told me himself in May 2015 about this news, and I confirmed it with the Rota. It says SSPX has not chosen to publicize it. Doubt he's, he's going back and forth with a commenter on the website here, and he says the SSPX has not chosen to publicize it, doubtless because of big mouth know nothings like yourself. Who are more interested in creating trouble and in finding the truth or seeking the good of the church? He also uh, says in here. Who, who is like big well know nothings like yourself? Who is he referring to? Various commenters on here who say that they they have researched this, they can find nothing about uh, uh, Fillet being a member of the Roman. Oh, they're with, objecting uh, that, that what he's saying is not true. Right, they're so saying he essentially says, where. Well, of course not, because yeah. of people like you. Exactly. He says they're, they're, they're asking where it. where is the proof? I've mean, seen no no proof, uh, no documentation uh, of this. And he, he says that this is, um, in fact, you know, the way that they, they plan to do things. He said, uh, he says, that, did it occur to you in your ignorant arrogance that the Vatican might not wish to publicize the fact precisely because it would be, quote, big news? And get this, Father. He says, plenty of SSPX priests are not even aware of it. It was kept quiet because the Vatican wanted it. So, Father, how um, just astounding is it to read that? You know, you, you say so often how... The, uh, the parishioners, the, the lay, the faithful people of the Society of St. Pius X, so many of them are such good people, even so many of, of the clergy, they, they seem to be such, such good members of clergy, and it really just seems to be the leadership. And this James Bogle, if this is true, what he's saying, I think that absolutely confirms uh, what you're saying. I agree, Tom. If what he's saying is true, and we have reason to believe it is, then, I mean, these good people are like lambs being led to the slaughter, and they're not even being told as to what is going on behind their backs. Now, if you look in pa the past history, okay, there have been times when it was very, very public that Bishop Fillet was going to the Vatican, meeting with Francis or his representatives, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, immediately after publication of, of you know, the fact, there were those uh, among the modernists who would cry foul and say, look, you can't be, you know, thinking about getting, getting these, allowing these people back in the church with all the tradition. And there were also traditionalists who would raise even a, a you know, a, a hue and cry and a clamor and a warning in the Society of St. Pius X saying, oh, you know, Bishop Valais going and, and working out a deal with Francis and we're going to be sold out. They're going to come with some kind of a, a deal and sign some document within six months. People were predicting this. And so since that happened uh, two or three times, it seems that the sub has submerged and now it is running silent and running deep, right? In the sense that now it looks as though all of this is being done on the QT. And uh, so the point is to avoid the 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 the, the rabid uh, mindless modernists from screaming you know foul uh, against any negotiations, but also to avoid the traditionalist, the traditional Catholics even within the society and perhaps especially within the society of Saint Pius X, to prevent them from knowing what's going on, because of the concerns that people have about this. Uh, there are obviously plenty of people in the society of Saint Pius X who don't have that confidence in Bishop Fillet that they would have had an Archbishop Lefebvre, and with good reason. Bishop Fillet is no Archbishop Lefebvre. There are not many men in the world today, I would put on that level, um, in any case, including myself. So the, the problem here is that the people have something going on that affects them very deeply, 
themselves, their families, everything from you know the souls of their children to their donations and and so on. Um, and they're being kept in the dark deliberately, precisely as he says, because the Vatican has an interest in keeping it quiet. And the SSPX has an interest in keeping it quiet. It's just going to happen. You know why this is especially interesting? It's because Bishop Fillet has in the past, and a recent past, said the problems are doctrinal problems. The issues are doctrinal issues. Which means they're matters of faith. Right. And so he's been saying, of course we're not going to compromise on those, and we're not going to be you know, getting back into union with, with, with uh, the modernists in Rome, because... I mean, after all, if there are issues of faith, we can't, we can't reunite with them. But what in fact is happening, there's kind of this slow process of almost uh, kind of grafting the society onto the modernist tree. And but little by little by little, Archbishop Lefebvre warned about that. He said, beware of modernists making concessions because they will never make concessions unless they believe it gives them an advantage. And uh, their, their purpose will always remain, just like the communists, to destroy the enemy. The purpose of the modernists is to basically do away with the traditional church entirely and replace it with the church of the world. So, um, you know, I'm afraid we're witnessing that happening, and so many of the members of the Society of Pius X and their clergy are being drawn into this unwittingly. This Bogle gentleman is willing to state it clearly. But not only that, recently, and one could mistake the names as I did originally, I guess there's a, a Jim Vogel. Correct. Who is a spokesman for the Angelus Press he's, the he's, Society? Is he's it? the editor in chief of the Angelus Press and the, the spokesperson for the Society in the United States. Oh, he's the spokesperson for the Society in the United States. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Because some of our own mem church members here at Immaculate Conception have uh, sent me links to interviews given by him recently, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which uh, parallel, well, even more than parallel, they yes. coincide with what this, I guess, James Bogle is saying, right? Yes, yes, Father. Well, of, of the, uh, what, what is it? Uh, Catholic United for the Faith? Or no? Catholic Answers Focused is, okay. is one, one in particular, one interview. That's where he gave the interview? Yes, Father, yes. Uh, it's, oh, uh, Unavoshi International, is that the one that Mr. That's Bogle James, James Bogle okay. was, was the Catholic actual Catholic president of that. Uh, yeah. Unavoshi International, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's actually a step higher in terms of the influence and knowledge mm -hmm. that he would have, mm -hmm. Mr. Bogle. Mm -hmm. But now Mr. Vogel of the Angeles Press mm -hmm. and the SSPX spokesman in yes. the United States has also come out and gone on record about the the status of the Society of St. Pius X. Right? Yes, Father, there, um, there's a, a fascinating interview. It's, it's a two-part interview. The, uh, the first part is just kind of a lot of, uh, a lot of history about the, the Society and just some, some general basics. But the second part, it's around a 20-minute long interview with this uh, Jim Vogel. And then there's the, uh, the host, I believe, is Cy Kellett is his name. And they're also joined by Father Hugh Barber, who is the... Who is Yeah. And Oprem, he's at Primo's Retention. That's the religious order I belonged to for right. six years. Right. So uh, he is the uh, I, he, he's uh, the the chaplain of this Catholic answers. Right. His service. name is familiar to me. Well, I I actually listened to this this interview in its entirety, Father, and I have to tell you, it is um, it's chock full of of modernism. It's incredible to hear these things coming from the mouth of a purported. This is, this is Jim Vogel. Jim Vogel, the who is the SSPX spokesman. Here? That that's my understanding. Yes, Father, that, mm -hmm. that he is the. Uh, what does he say is, about the status here. of the society? Um, he he says that that we are in communion with with Francis. We're in communion with with the Novus Ordo Church. He says that. Uh, um, it, it's, the interview starts out with the interviewer asking him which code of canon law they follow, and he says, "Oh, undoubtedly, the 1983, the new code of canon law. That is John the law. Paul II. That is that is the that's that's the, the law. The one that sanctions giving communion to non-Catholics. Exactly, and he actually points out that canon in particular and says, when it comes to things like this that are a little less vague, or, or a little vague, as he says, we uh, we he uses some language something like we interpret those through the lens of the 1917 code of canon law 
A little vague. <laughs> a little right. vague. What about where it just comes out and says that you can do this, right? That you can give communion to Catholics. Is that vague? So then, if he doesn't, if they don't agree with it, that's when they then they that follow the, the 1917. Whatever is vague is what they they find uh, uncomfortable. Right. Then they revert to the 1917 code or 1918 code of canon law. Right. This is actually what the Society of Saint Pius X does with the Mass too. Exactly. They'll follow the 1963 liturgy unless they don't. Right. You know, exactly. Unless they find it necessary to introduce exactly. things that were not in the 1962 liturgy. I, I think that that's the perfect, that's the epitome of a society of St. Pius X. I, I think that, that just sums up everything about them, the way they function, everything right there. That, you know, we've, the 1983 Code of Canon Law, that's what we follow, that's the law of the church, except for if we don't agree we with don't. something in there, and we'll go to that, that traditional way. Right. Um, but I can see how Francis would go along with that. It kind of... Uh, you know, yeah. it, it, that, that would resonate with Francis, yeah, yeah. I guess. We it, follow this unless we don't. Exactly. And it, it's interesting, Father, how you mentioned Bishop Fillet saying that, that the, the issues, the differences, their, their doctrinal differences. He actually, towards the end of the interview, says the exact opposite. says that, uh, you know, the, these are not doctrinal things. It, it's just little, um, you know, kind of the details that, that you priests and you clergy need to work out. It doesn't even matter for a little little layman like myself. It's just a few little insignificant details that, that need to be worked out. But this this Father Hugh Barber, he, he says, you know, we are in communion with the Society of St. Pius X. Uh, we, we, we love you. We embrace you. We welcome you. All of this um, this kind of modernist, wishy-washy uh, garbage, essentially. But it, it's it's just, just fascinating to, to hear how well everything he says perfectly coincides with everything that these modernists say. I mean, if if, if one just objectively listens to... Would you to, recommend that we direct people to listen for themselves, to hear? Oh, definitely, what they say? definitely. Maybe we ought to. Maybe we ought to, uh, you know, post that uh, link there for people yeah. to actually go and hear for themselves what yeah. is being said. Yeah. I, I think it's definitely definitely worth it. There, there's so much in it that just... Um, I mean, they, they try and break down every every barrier. There's one point in here where, where the interviewer asked him, you know, if I went to uh, a Sunday Mass at an, at an SSPX chapel, what would I see, what would it be like? And um, this, this uh, Jim Vogel, he, he really emphasizes this point, tries to drive it home, that you would not notice any difference between an SSPX chapel and your local diocesan Latin Mass or a Fraternity of St. Peter Mass, anything like that. You wouldn't notice a difference. It's just everything's essentially the same. And he, he just really tries to hammer this point in that, we are just like you. We are in communion with you. We're we're one and the same. We just have a few little insignificant details, mm -hmm. and um, it's really disheartening, I think, for any traditionalist to listen to this and see that this is what's become of the society of Saint Pius. It, it is. It is really tragic, truly. So, uh, but people have a need to know, a right to know I the think truth. So. so I think so. Um, well, I, I'm sorry to hear that, and again, uh, I. I at the risk of sounding bitter, <laughs> I don't want that. Who knows? But uh, I mean, we have to pray for them because I mean, what comes to mind when I'm hearing these things, uh, like very credible things about the society's new course. What comes to mind is the Titanic. You know, the Titanic broke in half. It broke. It broke up at sea, and you know, not long ago, we there was a hundred some. Clergymen of the Society of St. Pius X who broke away, calling themselves the resistance, or the, and th then it just began to sink into the waters, leaving people, you know, floating, trying to stay afloat for their lives in the frigid waters of the North Sea. And it's it's like the the uh, Her Majesty's steamship, the Titanic, is like the SS, you know, the steamship uh, Pius X. And it, it just impresses me as another tragedy, even worse than that one. Even worse than that. So, um, I mean, if that's the case, this is the, the, how could we call it the Bark of Peter? You know? mm -hmm. uh, the Ark of Salvation. If, if they're going to be uh, basically uh, relegating themselves and almost enslaving themselves or indenturing themselves as the Latin right of the Novus Ordo, you know, <laughs> within the modernist uh, in Novus Ordo land, right? I mean, basically, that's one of the, it's called <laughs> yes. Novus Ordo land. Yes. So this is, 
what this lady was saying, what would we have to do to convince you to come back to the Novus Ordo land? Mm. I mean, this is what we're talking about having with the Society of St. Pius X right they're, now. They're doing it. They're, they're coming and becoming full-fledged citizens, loyal citizens of, in Novus Ordo land. And Father, there was one other point of the interview that I wanted to mention where they get into this question of Sede Vicantism. The, the interview asks him, what is the society's position on this? And are you friendly with Sede Vicantes? And he, uh, Jim Vogel, he, he uh, clarifies that, you know, when we're talking about members of the society, St. Pius X, we're talking about the priest. Uh, he, he says he can't speak for any of the, the individual laypersons, but as far as the priest and the society in general, their position is, is absolutely not. They, this uh, Sede Vicantism is... Um, a, a big no-no, and he, he says how uh, Archbishop Lefebvre was so vehemently opposed to this idea of state of Vicantism, and he even found it necessary to expel certain priests, um, <laughs> certain priests uh, over this issue of state of Vicantism. <laughs> I couldn't imagine. <laughs> couldn't well, imagine. actually, uh, a certain priest I know who went to Archbishop Lefebvre about, about that very subject, when the Archbishop was putting a letter out it, and pointed it out to him, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, that there were certain errors in the letter. And the Archbishop actually, uh, at first, it's interesting, his reaction was, that's just a detail. But overnight he thought about it, and it didn't sit right with him, that there was something that wasn't quite accurate in his letter. The next day that priest went downstairs and saw the seminarians turning out another letter, that he'd rewritten the letter, in his mind correcting this. At that point, the priest who went to see him wished he had... I mean, I was the priest, okay? okay. And when I heard Monsignor Lefebvre <laughs> say, and I pointed out to him, look, there's something wrong with this, Monsignor Lefebvre. This is not true. And then he responded, I, I was heartbroken, because this is not my conception of Archbishop Lefebvre. <clears throat> that it doesn't matter whether it's true, because it's just a detail. It wasn't a detail. It was a criticism of the priests who worked so hard and long for years for the Society of St. Pius X, and successfully. <clears throat> and so there were things in the letter I didn't even go into. I just, you know, took my leave of him um, and um, amicably, and that's the last I ever saw him. But I saw that the next day he had corrected that one part of the letter, <clears throat> making it clear. I mean, the priests of the Society of St. Pius X do not say that the last pope alive was John the 20th, uh, John was, I'm sorry, was um, uh, Pope Pius the 12th. I've never heard any priest of the Society of St. Pius V say those words, ever, expressed that idea. I've never heard one on any occasion say that, <laughs> okay? Uh, but the Society of St. Pius X continues to just use this broad brush to tar everybody, tar and feather, or try to tar and feather everybody with this. Um, but... Um, that wasn't actually why Monsieur Lefebvre, you know, showed us the door. There were certain things, issues that created a quite crisis of conscience, which we can actually, I, I think we even have a video about that That's fine. Uh, that we just posted from, it was, it was made long ago, but it's still very, very pertinent to the yes. situation. But, but uh, tell me, Tom, I understand, and I've read this and heard this verbally communicated, that within the Society of St. Pius X, it's all right for a priest to, to believe Francis, for example, is not the Pope, as long as he keeps it as a personal belief and publicly represents the official position of the Society of St. Pius X. Did you see anything in these writings to that effect? Uh, I don't. I don't think they got into the, the um, that deep down into the details. That's my understanding of it. But um, obviously, the society, the leaders wouldn't wouldn't agree with that. Uh, that wouldn't be their desired position. But uh, but I, I I could pretty much guarantee the people in the, who are following the Society of Saint Pius X right now that if they were to uh, have a candid discussion with any number of priests in the society those priests would express at least a doubt <coughs> about the legitimacy of any papacy of Francis. And some might even come out and say, well, I don't believe it, he's a pope. Mm-hmm. But I have to kind of toe the party line in this. Right. And by the way, I mean, they, they make it sound in here. I mean, uh, Bogle, uh, Jim Bo- James Bogle, 
I think it was, makes it sound as though Archbishop Lefebvre was absolutely dead set against sedimentantism. And he was not. I mean, in principle, he recognized that it couldn't happen, that there could be a sedimentant situation. Okay? Monsieur Lefebvre himself wrote about this in his uh, Le Coup de Maitre de Satan, L'Obedience, bon, uh, okay? Obedience, the Masterstroke of Satan. He himself expressed the possibility that Paul VI might not be the Pope. This is back in the 1960s. And Monsieur Lefebvre uh, himself said so to us. He, he said, in French it sounds rather convoluted, in English it sounds rather convoluted too, but what he said was, I will not say that he's not the Pope, but neither will I say that one cannot say that he is not the Pope. And, um, I mean, we heard that with our ears from the mouth of Archbishop Lefebvre. And when they had the, uh, the World Day of Prayer in Assisi, before that took place, Monsieur Lefebvre says, if this happens, we may well have to reconsider uh, whether this is legitimate or even the papacy is legitimate. See, if, uh, so, I mean, he himself recognized in principle that someone who, you know, lives at the, uh, in the Vatican, or has the right address, and uh, wears the papal robes and so on and so forth, might not be the Pope for whatever reason, um, and possibly because of apostasy from the faith. Monsieur Lefebvre voiced that as a possibility. Now, he himself withdrew from it, I understand, because he thought that the consequence of that was too drastic. Um, but nonetheless, he at least acknowledged the possibility in terms of Catholic teaching, Catholic theology, that it was true. And he's not the only one. St. Francis of, of uh, Sales spoke very clearly about a pope losing the office of the papacy because of heresy. And there, uh, Cajetan, the great theologian, spoke of that, and what would happen in a case like that, um, that the bishops of the world would get together and simply declare that he'd lapsed into heresy and that, for all practical purposes, he had died to the faith. And so the seat was vacant. Uh, there are others, too, who, who brought up this, this very possibility. So, uh, Monsignor Graver even quoted uh, the great theologian, uh, for, uh, Suarez, Francesco Suarez, as uh, saying that if a pope would change all of the sacramental rites of the church, he himself would become schismatic and would be cut off from the church as a schismatic. So, uh, you know, this is not strange to Catholic theology. And all of these authors are approved and recognized by the church. So what they said was never condemned as being un-Catholic. Monsignor Lefebvre knew all of that. Um, he clearly <clears throat> had just come to the conclusion that it's such a drastic decision to make that he, he had to be very careful and was not ready to make that decision or voice that, voice that decision on the basis of what had happened in his time. But what has happened, but what did not happen in his time has happened in our time. Oh, definitely. And uh, judging from <clears throat> what he said about what was happening then, I can only imagine what he would be saying now, but he would not be saying, I'm certain, what the Society of St. Pius X is saying, and he would be saying what they are not saying. Exactly. And Father, it is absolutely fascinating to listen to this interview as this, uh, this Father Hugh Barber and, and Jim Vogel, they attempt to have this uh, a discussion concerning state of vacantism. At, at one point, this... Uh, Father Hugh Barber, he, he kind of interrupts and says that uh, state of econtism as a, a theological position is, is totally untenable. It's impossible. And there's, there's kind of this awkward silence. And then uh, Jim Vogel, he agrees with this, says yes. And then Father, this Father Barber, he goes on kind of this long-winded um, explanation. It's, it's very, very sad to listen to this, where he's almost kind of searching for something of substance, and, and he comes up with nothing, where he, he goes through this progression of saying, well, there have been many times, such as the Great Western Schism, when there were uh, several claimants to the Pope, but of course there could only be one true Pope, and one kind of has to wonder, what, what does this have to do with, with state of vacantism? Um, <laughs> and he says uh, how the, the Church cannot survive long periods of time without, without a Pope, offers no... Um, 
no kind of, uh, of proof or, or anything concerning that, just states it plainly as, as a fact. Um, and meanwhile, as he's saying all this, Jim Vogel is, is just nodding right along, agreeing with everything he says. And uh, he, he kind of just, at one point, he says that, uh, that, you know, we have, it would be ridiculous not to acknowledge Francis as the Pope because all, all of the, the bishops of the world everywhere, everyone acknowledges him as the Pope. Therefore, he has to be the Pope. Uh, but he says that, you know, a lot of the state of Vicantism question, it arises so frequently because of the abuses of authority that are seen. And he says, well, these abuses of authority can never get really, really bad because then all of the bishops would kind of interject and, and impose their, uh, some kind of sanctions on this pope. So he, he's saying that essentially things are not yet really, really bad. And one has to wonder how much worse can things get before they are, quote, really, really bad. And he, he goes through just all of these silly kind of long-winded um, straw men arguments and comes up with nothing. And Jim Vogel just acknowledges every point uh, on cue. And it's, it's just very, very pitiful. I mean, even anyone with a very basic understanding of state of Vicantism and the church's teaching on it could refute every point mm -hmm. that is made here very, very simply. So it's, it's just, it's really disheartening, really sad to listen to this interview. All right. They can't even admit the possibility no. No. That, that Francis might not be a, no. a true Catholic pope. No. They won't even acknowledge it. So, um, okay. Well, they, they'll just have to follow him into the, into the Amazon then. That's, that's where they're uh, going. That's where they're going. By the way, you know, I, I just mentioned the name The Beast of the Amazon for the title of two recent programs. Sure. In which I read through the document, because I figured most people wouldn't R read through the documents. I thought, well, I, I will read through this instrument of laboris, this working document, go through it and try to analyze it as well as I can, and then read through it for everybody who wants to watch and listen. And I was surprised at how many did. I was told that if you have a, a, a program that's divided into two parts, if you get half as many listening to part two as you had listening to part one, you're doing very well. <laughs> Well, the fact is that uh, the, the numbers are very close. You know, as far as the number who watched part one, which is only like 55 minutes long or so, uh, is not, there's, there's a very slight difference uh, of those who went on to listen to part two. And that's an hour and 20 minutes of programming. But I was surprised at how many actually persevered to listen to part two because that's where they got into the essential plans they have. Not only for the... The, notice, uh, the church in the Amazon, but throughout the whole world, because that's what they want to do. They want to use what they do in the Amazon as a, as a model for the, what they're going to do in the rest of the world. I was gratified to see so many others push through to, to find out, well, what's the punchline? What are they getting at? What are they planning on doing here? But when I named the movie, or the, the program, The Beast of the Amazon, I was surprised to find there was actually a movie, a feature-length movie, from, I think, the 1950s, or maybe 1960, called Kurusu, the Beast of the Amazon. And it was like supposed to be some kind of horror adventure film. And uh, the plot was really <clears throat> strange because it talked about this these researchers that went into the Vatican and into the Amazon, <laughs> into the Amazon <laughs> to find some medicine, a cure for cancer. <clears throat> but all the, the natives were... were uh, People were, were fleeing the area because of this monster that was chasing them away from the works they were doing, you know. And uh, so they had a guide, these people had a guide, who, who wanted to betray them into the hands of this monster to destroy them. It turned out the guide was the monster. And he was trying to drive these people out of the Amazon and drive the, the native workers away because he wanted to be the leader of the people to bring them back to their native roots again and away from Western and European culture and away from Catholic faith he wanted to restore the indigenous culture to the people and uh, was his name Francis? it seems like just the, <laughs> the other way around you know <laughs> so it's it's really peculiar to see that and you know I even read some reviews of the movie and the reviews were spot on if you applied the reviews to Francis's, to the, to the Instrumentum Laboris. If you applied the reviews of that movie 
to the working document they've got for the Senate of the Amazon, they, they apply perfectly. Anyway, I don't think we'll post a link to that. But. <laughs> anyway, oh, uh, it's, it's peculiar to see something almost quasi pathetically prophetic <laughs> about what we're seeing before our very eyes now, the beast of the Amazon. Wow. He's wearing, it, it, well, never mind it. <laughs> Better not go on about that. By the way, I don't think it can, I don't think it's possible to get a co uh, to see the movie. No, I think it's kind darn. of uh, gone the way of. Oh darn! <laughs> <laughs> yes, this was uh, not. This did not work. We can just follow Francis instead and see what happens. I like. guess we'll just have to, yeah, catch the. What do they call it? The remake or the? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, they're yeah. going to. Uh, sequel. Uh, the sequel. No. <laughs> the sequel is going to take place in October, <laughs> in the Vatican. Well, well, Father, thank you for being here tonight to discuss all of these very important matters. Thank you for taking time out of your, your busy schedule. No, well, I, I appreciate it. Well. Many others do as well. So well, thank that's, you. that's visual. Thank no, you. No Thanks to our viewers also. God bless you all for your support and yes. prayers. And uh, I want you to know that when you do send uh, communication in, whether it be pro or con, whether it be a question or an answer, I, I do keep you in my prayers and remove you in Mass. So we appreciate it. Uh, you know, the information you send, the questions you send, the observations you send, the, of course, the financial support you send, it's all appreciated. And uh, you do uh, show that appreciation in prayer. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you to all of our viewers for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, finally to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.